Ezekiel 22. And the word of Yahuwah came to me, saying, And now, son of man, judge, judge the city of blood, and you shall show her all her abominations. What's the city of blood? Jerusalem. Her. And we'll see elsewhere. She, Jerusalem, is referred to as her. And you shall say, Thus said the master Yahuwah, The city sheds blood in her midst, that her time might come, and she has made idols within herself to become defiled. I was talking earlier with my wife about this, that the, the fleshly version of this is whoring. The spiritual version of this is idolatry. When you participate in idolatry, you are whoring against Yahuwah. And that's where all this Torah comes, for, comes from regarding a man and his wife and what is legal to put them away and what is not legal to put them away. And it all comes down to unfaithfulness. And unfaithfulness to Yah is idolatry. So back to Ezekiel 22 verse 3. And you shall say, Thus said the master Yahuwah, The city sheds blood in her midst, that her time might come, and she has made idols within herself to become defiled. Just like a wife becomes defiled due to adultery, or a husband becomes defiled due to adultery, Jerusalem, the city of blood, has become defiled due to her idolatry. And you... And, sorry, gotta... This gets into bitter waters, Meribah. When the um, children of Israel are whining to Moshe, they're being unfaithful. There's a Torah for a, a wife who is accused by a jealous husband for unfaithfulness. And it's a ceremony of proving where the potentially unfaithful wife is brought by the jealous husband. And our Yah is a jealous Yah, right? to the high priest and the priest mix up, mixes up some water for her to drink and she's laid bare from the, basically her garment from the top down is stripped bare and uh, so what? She's exposing her inward parts. This is all an analogy to Yeshua and end times by the way. And she drinks the bitter water and if she's not found guilty, the water does nothing. But if she is, the water consumes her from the inside out. She dies. She wastes away and she dies. Same word in the New Testament in Revelation is wormwood. Wormwood, the bitter waters. It's approving from a jealous husband, Elohim, with his bride, you, the believers, and some would say, the church, ah, read Revelation. There's a lot of churches that don't, don't put a smile on y'all's face. The woman, who could have been in adultery, and what is, what is spiritual adultery? It's idolatry. And then the high priest, who's the high priest now per Hebrews? Yeshua, right? So see how it all plays together? It's, it's, not, it's not just a physical ritual. It's a spiritual and metaphysical ritual as well, and it's also um, prophetic. So I know, we've made it four verses. You have become guilty by the blood which you have shed, and have defiled yourself with the idols which you have made. Thus you brought your days near, and have come to the end of your years. Therefore I shall make you a reproach to the nations, and a mockery to all lands. I just have to say this, if a husband divorces a wife, he cannot retake her because she's defiled if she remarries, right? Which just destroys replacement theology, biblically speaking, because if the husband is, or, you know, the bridegroom, right? The marriage supper of the lamb, right? Well, if you're the bride and you've been divorced, put away, the husband can't take you back and while Israel, the house of Judah and the house of Israel, did all kinds of abominations, some of which we're reading about here in Ezekiel, the father never put them away. 
He did put the tribe of Dan away. Go watch my Revelation series on that. That's a different conversation. But Judah, Benjamin, Levi, Issachar, uh, Asher, Gad, uh, Manasseh, Ephraim, etc., etc., etc. They're all in the book of Revelation, along with all the Gentile believers in Messiah. So I guess he didn't put them away, did he? Which destroys the churchianity replacement theology of, see, the, essentially, the Jews messed up, so God put them away, and then he adopted the church as his new chosen people. That sounds great, except that it's not biblical. I shall never leave you nor forsake you, and the Father's word does not return to him void. If he said it, he meant it. So it doesn't matter what the pastor, the priest, the rabbi said, if it's not in line with what Yah said. Which is why every one of y'all should have your Bibles open and should be reading along right now. And you should know you should know what Yah's word says so that it can't be weaponized against you. Because remember Hasatan, when Yeshua is in the wilderness for 40 days. How does Hasatan, Satan, the Nahash, the serpent, the trier, the accuser, pick your uh, translation. How does Hasatan tempt Yeshua? By quoting scripture at him. So just because scripture is coming out of somebody's face doesn't mean that they're in line with Yah's will. Okay? Okay. Me included, which is why you should try, you should reprove everything, everything that you receive when it comes to Yah's word. Verse 5. Those near and those far from you mock you, defiled is your name, and great the confusion. See the leaders of Israel, each one has used his arm to shed blood in you. And we're going to go into an entire dispensation on Torah versus not Torah here. The shedding of innocent blood against Torah. They have despised their father and their mother within you. Uh, dude, that's one of the big ten, Exodus 20. So, not Torah. They have oppressed the stranger in your midst. Not Torah. Not allowed to do that. They have wronged the fatherless and the widow within you. 100% not Torah. Forsake not the widow and the orphan. So, and so Yah is itemizing out. He's giving them bullet points here of all the transgressions that they've done, which is why he's bringing this judgment upon them. You have despised that which is set apart wholly to me, and you have profaned my Sabbaths. Yah's Sabbaths. Well, I do my Sabbath on Sunday. You think he gives a crap about how you want to do it? Who's the Elohim in this relationship? Him or you? Who has more authority? Him or you? Him or your priest? Him or your pastor? Him or your rabbi? Him or your bishop? You profaned Yah's Sabbaths. Not your Sabbaths. Not your doctrines and dogmas. Yah's Sabbaths. Definitely not Torah. Slanderous men have been in you to shed blood. Slander against Torah. Shedding of innocent blood against Torah. And in you are those who eat on the mountains. They have done wickedness in your midst. The mountains, the high places. These were centers of false worship where the Ashura, the Asherim were at. Where the altars to Baal were at. Right? Idolatry is spiritual whoring. In you, in Jerusalem, they have uncovered the nakedness of a father. Definitely not Torah. Read the story of Noah after uh, the, flood, the flood subside. In you, they have humbled women, raped women, who were defiled during their uncleanness. Rape, not Torah. Being with a woman during her monthly period, not Torah. And the one has done abomination with his neighbor's wife. Definitely not Torah. And another has wickedly defiled his daughter-in-law. Definitely not Torah. And another within you has humbled, raped his sister, his father's daughter. Definitely not Torah. In you they have taken a bribe to shed blood. Not Torah. You have taken interest and increase. Not allowed to take interest and increase from your brothers. Definitely not Torah. You have cut off your neighbor by extortion. Not Torah. And you have forgotten me, declares the Master Yahuwah. It's the first command in the Big Ten, Exodus 20. 
and you have forgotten me, declares the Master Yahweh. How do you think he feels about that? You're so worried about him forgetting you that maybe you've forgotten him. And see, I shall strike my hand because of your greedy gain which you have made and at the bloodshed which has been in your midst. Would your heart stand, your hands be strong in the days when I deal with you? I, Yahuwah, have spoken and shall do it. How interesting. Almost as if his word shall not return to him void. It amazes me how many people are constitutional literalists but not biblical literalists. That if you change a letter, an apostrophe, a colon to a semicolon in the Constitution, we understand there how it changes the meaning of the phraseology of what's being said, what's being conveyed by men on a piece of parchment. Yet, so many Americans are unwilling to be biblical literalists to take the word of God at its face value. We understand that the Constitution is not open to interpretation, but yet somehow the word of God is? How interesting. And for all the people who are like, well, the Bible was written by a bunch of men. So was the Declaration of Independence. So was the Constitution. So was the Bill of Rights. Yet people hang their hat, stake their worth on that, self-identify with that 24-7, 365 in this country. But the Word of God that was written by the finger of Elohim into stone, that's open for interpretation. Well, it doesn't actually say, it doesn't really mean that. Well, my, my pastor told me that, cool, if your senator told you that this part of the Constitution meant this, and it was against what was actually written down, do you believe that senator or don't you? See, the difference is more people in this country know about the Constitution than they do about the Word of God. Because they're willing to be spoon-fed the Word of God without their own personal reproof and instruction and research than they are to be spoon-fed by some jerk in a suit, their constitutional freedoms. How impressed do you think you is with that? And when I say with that, I mean with you and your commitment and conviction to a piece of parchment that's 250 years old rather than to the words of Yahuwah, your Elohim, carved in stone by the finger of God that are millennia old. And with God, there is no shifting, no shadows of changing. I'm the Lord Yahuwah Sabaoth, I change not. His word will not return to him void. If he said it, he meant it. Just throwing that out there. And I shall scatter you among the nations, and shall disperse you throughout the lands, and shall consume your filthiness out of you. And you shall profane yourself before the eyes of the nations, and you shall know that I am Yahuwah. See, this is a promise made to the seed of Abraham, to Abraham's face, that you will esteem all nations. And then it's a promise that Shaul of Tarsus, the apostle Paul, reminds us about in Romans 4. Hey, God said that we would go out to all nations. And now these nations are being gathered back into the house of Elohim. They're coming back into the family. How interesting. And see, we, we have short lives. No longer shall I tarry with man more than 120 years. And so we don't see the full arc of time. We don't see the beginning and the end, the alpha and the omega, if you will, the aleph and the tav of this arc of space-time for Yahuwah to accomplish his vision rather than how we think that it should be. And you shall profane yourself before the eyes of the nations, and you shall know that I am Yahuwah. And the word of Yahuwah came to me, to Ezekiel Yehezkel, saying, Son of man, the house of Israel has become dross to me. All of them are bronze and tin and iron and lead in the midst of a furnace. They have become the dross of silver. Therefore, thus said the Master Yahuwah, because all of you have become dross. What's dross? You ever watch those like smelting videos on YouTube? I know my wife has. She watches them all the time, right? And they pour all these metals into a crucible and they heat the crucible up and the metals melt and all the impurities rise to the top where they're scooped off. So that, and every time you smelt this metal in the crucible, 
more and more impurities come out of it and they're they're dredged off that is the dross it's the removing of the impurities so that you're left with purity verse 19 therefore thus said the master yahuwah because all of you have become dross therefore see i am gathering you into the midst of jerusalem as they gather gather silver and bronze and iron and lead and tin into the midst of a furnace the crucible, to blow fire on it, to melt it, so I gather you in my displeasure and in my wrath, and I shall blow and melt you. And I shall gather you and blow on you with the fire of my wrath, and you shall be melted in its midst. As silver is melted in the midst of a furnace, so are you melted in its midst. And you shall know that I, Yahuwah, have poured out my wrath on you. And the word of Yahuwah came to me, saying, Son of man, say to her, the city of blood, Yerushalayim, Jerusalem. You are a land that is not cleansed or rained upon in the day of displeasure. I'm going to dry up the heavens. You ever think about rain as a mikvah for the land, as a baptism for the land, without which nothing grows? Hmm. Hmm. Curious. Son of man, say to her, you are a land that is not cleansed or rained upon in the day of displeasure. There is a conspiracy of her prophets in her midst, like a roaring lion tearing the prey. The Lion of Judah. There's a conspiracy of the prophets. If there's a conspiracy amongst the prophets, whose word do you think they're speaking? Yah's word or their word? They have devoured life. They have taken wealth and precious matters. They have made many widows in her midst. Now, this next portion, there's a really interesting crossover here into Christendom doctrinal teachings, which is Matthew chapter 11. So I'll read this part and then we'll go to Matt 11, Matthew Yahoo, and uh, do some compare contrast. Her priests have done violence to my teaching. Remember that. Her priests, Jerusalem, have done violence to my teaching, to Yahuwah's teaching. And they profane my set-apart, my holy matters. They have not distinguished between the set-apart and the profane, nor have they made known the difference before unclean and clean. And they have hidden their eyes from my Sabbaths, and I am profaned in their midst. Boy, does this sound like churchianity to me. Her leaders in her midst are like wolves tearing the prey to shed blood, to destroy lives, and to get greedy gain. And her prophets have coated them with whitewash. You Pharisees, you're like a whitewashed tomb, for outside is beautiful, but inside is corruption and death. Paraphrasing New Living Bear Translation. Her leaders in her midst are like wolves tearing the prey to shed blood, to destroy lives, and to get greedy gain. And her prophets have coated them with whitewash, seeing a false vision and divining a lie for them, saying, Thus said the master Yahuwah, Thus saith the Lord, when Yahuwah had not spoken. The people of the land have practiced oppression and committed robbery and have wronged the poor and needy, and they have oppressed the stranger without right ruling. And I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the breach before me, Yahuwah, on behalf of the land, that I should not destroy it, an intercessor. But I did not find one, clearly illustrating the need for a Mashiach, the Mashiach, the anointed one, Messiah. There was no one, no man, to stand in between Yah and Jerusalem and plead the case of Jerusalem. Therefore, I have poured out my displeasure on them. Do you remember Moshe, Moses, and the Ten Commands and the Golden Calf? And Yah is pissed. He is wroth. He comes, he sees what's going on, and he's like, Moshe comes back up the mountain, and Yah says, I'm going to kill them all. I'm going to kill all of them. I'm going to make a nation out of you, Moshe. And Moshe pleads with Yah intercedes on behalf of the nation of Israel, the 
the 12 tribes and says, what would the Egyptians think? What would they think in Mitzrayim? That you, the mighty Yahuwah, brought these people out of Mitzrayim, out of Egypt, into the wilderness just to kill them? And remember your covenant with Abraham. If you want to make a nation with me, go ahead. But what will everybody else think when you kill all these people? That's intercession. And here, in the midst of Ezekiel 22, Yah is looking for a man to intercede on behalf of Jerusalem. There's not one. I sought a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the breach before me on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it, but I did not find one. Therefore I have poured out my displeasure on them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath, and I have put their way on their own head, declares the Master Yahuwah. Now, go back to verse 26. Her priests have done violence to my teachings, and they profane my set-apart matters. Now flip to Matthew 11. That's right there in the, uh, the New Testament. Matthew 11, verse 12. You know what? We'll just read some of Matthew 11. And it came to be when Yeshua, Messiah, Jesus, ended instructing his twelve taught ones, that he set out from there to teach and to proclaim in their cities. And when Yochanan, John, had heard in the prison, John the Baptist, he was arrested at this point, the works of Messiah, he sent two of his taught ones. So John sends a couple of his apostles. And said to him, said to Yeshua, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? Are you the Messiah, or do we keep looking? And Yeshua answering said to them, Go report to John what you hear and see. These are all prophecies of the Messiah. So Yeshua is saying, You've seen for yourself with your own eyes. Go tell John that this is what's going on. The blind receive sight, and the lame walk. Why did Yeshua do all these healings? Because he's the anointed one, and he's been prophesied all throughout the Torah and the prophets that this is what the Mashiach would do. And so he's doing it. And so he's telling the apostles, Yeshua is telling the apostles of John, go report this to John, because John knows the word, and John will be able to ascertain that this is in fact the Mashiach, because you shall know them by their fruits. Yeshua is not saying, yeah, I'm the guy, take my word for it. He's saying, no. Go tell John what you've seen. You say you have faith. I will show you my faith by my works. This is what I've been doing. The blind receive sight and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed. This was a huge, in the tribe of Judah, this was a huge indicator that the Mashiach had returned. Lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up and the poor are brought the good news. It's interesting, the good news, that comes from Isaiah 61, way before the death, burial, and resurrection of Yeshua, hmm. the gospel. What, what is it? It's the reestablishing of the kingdom of Elohim. Hmm. I know. I had this stuff in black and white right here in the Bible. And blessed is he who does not stumble in me. Blessed is he who believes that Yeshua is the Messiah based upon these things. And as these were going, Yeshua began to say to the crowds concerning John. And I love this. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? You went out to the wilderness to meet a man of Elohim? And you thought you were going to find Joel Osteen? But what did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft garments? Look, those wearing soft garments are in the houses of kings. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I say to you, and more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it was written, See, I send my messenger before your face, who shall prepare your way before you. Malachi 3.1 John, in the words of Yeshua, was more than a prophet. He was anointed to announce the coming of the Messiah. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has not risen one greater than John the Immerser, Yochanan the Immerser, John the Baptist. Yet the least one in the kingdom of heavens is greater than he. Mm. And here's why we're here, verse 12. And from the days of Yochanan the Immerser till now, 
The reign of the heavens is violated and the violence sees it. There's many translations for this. But the kingdom of heaven has violence done to it and the violence try and take it. What does that mean? And I've heard myriad sermons on this that violent brutish ones are trying to overtake the kingdom of heaven but we can co overcome by our belief in blood. Stand by. What does it mean? Because where have we seen this before? And from the days of John the Baptist till now, the reign of the heavens, the kingdom of heaven is violated and the violent sees it. Hmm. If only we had some context. Flip back over to Ezekiel 22, verse 26. Her priests have done violence to my teaching and they profane my set apart matters. They have not distinguished between the set-apart and the profane, nor have they made known the difference between the unclean and the clean. And they have hidden their eyes from my Sabbaths, and I am profaned in their midst. So here's Yeshua. Here is Yeshua. Compare, contrast, in his words, between John the Baptist, the, greater, the greatest of anyone born of a woman, more than a prophet, comparing that with the violent, who are trying to overtake the kingdom of heaven. What do those violent people look like? Priests who have done violence to Yah's teaching, my, capital M, Yahuwah's teaching, and they profane my set-apart, my holy matters, Torah. They have not distinguished between the set-apart and the profane, Torah. Nor have they made known the difference between the unclean and the clean, Torah, which means instruction, and they have hidden their eyes from my Sabbaths, Torah, and I am profaned in their midst. Her leaders in her midst are like wolves tearing the prey. Does not Yeshua compare the Pharisees and the Sadducees to wolves? And he's the good shepherd? Like wolves tearing prey to shed blood, didn't they murder him? To destroy lives and to get greedy gain. Woe, beware the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. Right? They love to sit up front. They love to be spoken well of in the marketplace for they make their zitziot long and their tefillin large and greedy gain. And her prophets have coated them with whitewash. Doesn't Yeshua say, if you don't know Moshe, you don't know me. Seeing a false vision and divining a lie from them saying, thus said the master Yahuwah, when Yahuwah had not spoken. So who are these violent that Yeshua is talking about? In Matthew 11, the reign of the heavens is violated and the violence sees it. The kingdom of heaven is violated by false teachers, bad doctrine, and the violence see it. For all the prophets in the Torah prophesied until Yochanan. And if you wish to accept it, he is Eliyahu Elijah who is about to come before me. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Ezekiel 22, don't let the violent men who profane Yahuwah overtake the kingdom of heaven. Yeshua, when he came the first time, it was to restore the kingdom of heaven. He taught nothing other than what had already been written in the Torah and the prophets. In fact, you can see in Luke 22, I'm sorry, Luke 24, after the death, burial, and resurrection of Yeshua. Luke 24. Yeshua's walking. He's walking down the road, and two of his apostles are also walking down the road. And it came to be, verse 15, as they were talking and reasoning that Yeshua himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were, were restrained so that they did not know him. And he said to them, what are these words you are exchanging with each other as you were walking? And you're sad? And the one whose name was Cleophas answered and said to him, are you the lone visitor in Jerusalem who does not know what took place in these days? And he, Yeshua, said to them, what? And they said to him, concerning Yeshua of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before Elohim and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and impaled him. We, however, were expecting that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. 
redeem. You know what it means to redeem somebody? To pay a debt that they cannot pay so that they enter into your house as a bondservant. There's a Torah for that. But besides all this, today is the third day since these matters took place. But certain women of ours who arrived at the tomb early also astonished us when they did not find his body. They came saying that they had seen a vision of messengers who said he was alive. And some of those who went with us to the tomb and found it, as also the women had said, but they did not see him, Yeshua. And he, Yeshua, said to them, O thoughtless ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the Torah and prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Messiah to suffer these and enter into his esteem? Yes, Mashiach ben Joseph, the suffering servant, one half of the prophecies of Messiah, fulfilled by the first coming of Yeshua. Mashiach ben David, the righteous king, shall be fulfilled in the second coming of Yeshua. And the fulfillment thus far has been through, prophetically, through the spring feasts as outlined in Leviticus 23. The covering of blood, Passover, the removal of sin, unleavened bread, and the first fruits of the resurrection, uh, which is Yeshua rising from the dead, first fruits, and then Shavuot, the day that the Father makes covenant with his people with the receiving of the Holy Spirit by 3000 in Acts chapter 2. That was the first coming of Mashiach. The second coming is trumpets, atonement, Sukkot. Trumpets announcing the coming of the king. Atonement, the great day of the Lord, where everybody is covered with sackcloth and ashes and repents and there's fasting, weeping, gnashing of teeth. And then Sukkot, when we dwell together in unity with Yah forever. And see, the Jews were looking for two different messiahs, each coming one time. They didn't realize, and they won't realize until Yeshua returns again, that it was one messiah coming twice. First, to fulfill all the prophecies relating to Mashiach ben Joseph, and second, to fulfill all the prophecies relating to Mashiach ben David, a righteous king in the line of King David, which is why Matthew chapter 1 begins with Yeshua's genealogy, his Bedora Tav, Hebrew word for lineage, genes, genetics, from Adam to Joseph. And beginning at Moshe and all the prophets... He, Yeshua, was explaining to them in all the scriptures the matters concerning himself. Beginning at Moshe, the Torah, and all the prophets, Torah and prophets, Yeshua is explaining all the matters concerning himself. Going back to Ezekiel 22, 26, her priests have done violence to my teaching and they profane my set-apart matters. If you don't know the Torah, the prophets, the resurrection, and you're dependent upon a priest to spoon-feed them to you, you will miss the coming of Messiah, the return of Messiah. Because violent men take the kingdom by force. And those violent men that Yeshua is talking about in Matthew chapter 11, verse 12, are those who are doing violence to the teaching, and they profane set-apart matters. Ezekiel 22. Bless y'all. Shalom.